Okay. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the experience we had in Utrecht with the Utrecht Pesco compiler, straying into JavaScript land. Um, this is work uh, for the major part done by the two second and third co-authors, uh, two of our students who have been making a small library and uh, porting an application to JavaScript using UAC. Um, so what I want to do is, uh, well, first observe that we probably all want to get rid of JavaScript, and actually this is not immediately my direct observation, but I've copied bits and pieces of uh, the JavaScript problem web page on the Haskell Wiki. Um, so there are several approaches to be found there, and UHC is one of them, namely compiling to JavaScript. Um, and in some way it's kind of, we're in a kind of a corner if we want to enter a web browser programming then we have to live and we have to deal with the JavaScript and that's basically the premise of this whole exercise. Um, so, the work in itself is not adding lots of technicalities <coughs> which are new. The only thing which we did uh, have a bit of freedom, a little bit of experimentation was the foreign function interface. There is still in the foreign function interface a string which specifies an entity to, what, to uh, which you want to um, refer to in the JavaScript world and there is freedom to experiment there with more elaborate notation and that's actually what we've done. Um, there are alternative approaches. Uh, if you look a little bit around, you can see that there are actually two variations of GAT, two clones, so to say, with modifications which compile the SG code to JavaScript. Uh, but then these are more or less limited to the GAC world of interfacing to the outside world. Um, there is a lot of older stuff, even. Um, some five years ago, there was already York Haskell compiler and generating JavaScript. But regretfully, York Haskell compiler is not living anymore. And there are, of course, variations on the theme, but they live in the JavaScript world. Either right? you compile um, with a JavaScript written compiler, or you merge the JavaScript and the Haskell worlds. So you have a Haskell programming idiom in the sense that you have functions basically usable, available. So, um, this, it all, this all would be nice, I think, uh, to have this, uh, to have something like Haskell running on a different platform, um, because it allows you to improve on JavaScript, and you can also go take further steps, for example, there is this clean system, um, which uses, which exploits very explicitly the fact that it compile, can compile for two platforms, namely just the Unix environment and uh, JavaScript, and then is uh, able at one time to switch between the two worlds and uh, move a little bit of code uh, to the browser so it can dynamically choose uh, where to run a particular bit of functionality. So having this available, um, this ability to run on different platforms, uh, well, opens new possibilities. So, what I will talk about today is a little bit about, uh, about the implementation machinery. Uh, then I will uh, delve a little bit more into the interaction with JavaScript. This will particularly be about the foreign function interface and how this can be exploited. Uh, if there is time, I will show you how the final ported application will look like and hopefully then also show you that there is indeed uh, absolutely non-readable JavaScript code to be viewed uh, inside the browser and to be executed. Um, and there are some lessons in terms of uh, yeah, what are the consequences for UHC, but I also think for any Haskell compiler, GHC maybe, also when you stray into JavaScript world, when you go outside the Unix boundaries, then yeah, you bump into limitations and to, uh, you have to deal with this, I think. So there are a couple of lessons to be learned, I think. Okay, so uh, implementation machinery, um, that's all rather simple. Uh, I see that it's not fully... I don't know why this is happening. Well, it's just a title which hopefully disappears. Implement implementation machinery. So, uh, the basic idea is that you generate JavaScript functions when you uh, generate code for the JavaScript world, but anything which has to deal with laziness you have to tackle separately. So everything which can be a thing 
uh, is wrapped in either a function object, if you have to deal with wrapping functions, uh, or when you partially or fully or saturated or oversaturatedly apply arguments, then you create a wrapper application object, and these are concisely named underscore f underscore, or specifically the a with underscores around it. Finally, you have to get to the actual value, computing the weak act normal form, and there is a JavaScript function which does do this for you. Uh, it's a trampoline-based approach. Um, every function itself can return a new continuation, which is then called by the, the evaluator and looks over it until you finally reach uh, a JavaScript value. So there is a merge between the two worlds. You actually can manipulate JavaScript values, but the laziness has special objects hanging around it. Okay, so for example, um, just a simple function adding a couple of values. The actual code being generated is just a JavaScript function, but it is wrapped inside this underscore f underscore uh, object. Uh, if you apply values to it, this is basically taking the, the object created, the add3 object, and you apply an array of arguments to it. And then finally you take this value and you evaluate it until you get weak at normal form, which is an actual integer value in this case, or an actual numerical value as it lives in the JavaScript world. So the actual work is delegated to JavaScript. So the, the real interesting part does not really lie in the actual code being generated, it's reasonably predictable, uh, but it lies in the interaction with the JavaScript world. That's where some of the fun lies. Um, but that means that you have to deal inside the browser with uh, DOM-like functionality. You have to access uh, elements of, uh, of, of content of a browser. Uh, and you have to take care of the fact that you, on the one hand, are dealing with objects, and on the other hand, you're dealing with data types, constructors. Um, and the foreign function interface has to, well, shift between these two worlds. And this is where a foreign expression language, as you might call it, comes into play. And the idea is that you map arguments passed from the Haskell world uh, to JavaScript worlds, they are evaluated, and then you provide a small template uh, in which the arguments in principle are based, pasted. So, for example, if you want to invoke a substring routine uh, on a sub some string object, you provide the two additional arguments. Well, usually in the Haskell world, this would mean that you would have a substring function, uh, which takes three arguments, and the first one then is the object to which you apply uh, the arguments, or you send the method to um, with these two arguments, and then the notation provides you with a little bit of JavaScript syntax. And the, uh, the whole idea is that this entity string uh, is well, not specified what it should mean, it just depends on the name of the, the, the language to which you're interfacing. In this case, there is this freedom to uh, give this uh, a more luxurious form. And the idea is here that, in principle, uh, the idea is that you directly relate to actual functions living in the JavaScript world, but that would mean, in this case, that you would, re would, would need to write a wrapper around this uh, invocation uh, where you send two arguments via a method to one object. Um, so, in order to shortcut that, you, this notation uh, allows, is, is a little bit easier to do this. So, the idea is you have this special syntax, uh, in this case, first argument is this person one, uh, substring the method name and then the rest of the arguments are filled in. There is more elaborate notation, uh, also for referring to strings, also for referring to indices. Because you can have array indices also incorporated there and you may uh, combine this. The other way around, of course, is also rather useful and actually quite necessary um, because you want to have uh, Java, uh, JavaScript also being able to use Haskell functions. For example, in this example in the next slide, I'll show you how you can actually provide a function in Haskell which is bound to a button 
uh, and then actually executed from the JavaScript world. The idea is also relatively straightforward in this case. You have a Haskell function and uh, the wrapper manipulates evaluation and, and wrapping it around uh, application objects as you would expect. The principal idea is you just take this Haskell function, you wrap it inside an application given the arguments from the JavaScript world. You don't have to take care of any marshalling because the whole idea is that uh, the JavaScript world can also live in the Haskell world. And then you evaluate everything and this is being given back. So, as a small program, a small web browsing example, um, it's just one of the examples I just picked from the net somewhere, uh, from the W3 site, where I got some, just some small examples. In this case, it's an example where two input fields are present in a browser, um, and you've got these values. So, if you push this button, I, I will, won't do it, but I, I guess you will believe this. If you push this button, the content of you one the first one will be copied to the second one. If you write this in plain JavaScript, then you will have um, that you, you take the value of the field one and you put it in the field two. So the, co the code required code is just incorporated in the uh, third and the fourth line here. And the rest is just binding everything together. Um, and on the bottom you can see that there is a button on click where you refer to this copy text uh, function. So now the idea is write this in Haskell. So you end up with something like this. Um, the meat of the story is that you require a copy text, which on the bottom is bound to uh, bound by exporting to the copy text in the JavaScript world. And um, what, what you can see is you have to fetch the document, uh, you have to fetch the field value uh, from this document, you have to do it twice for the two different fields, and then you should set uh, from the second uh, document element the attribute value in order to have this effect. So, this is all rather straightforward, um, but there are already some, well, actually, a couple of meta observations here to be made. Um, this code is definitely not shorter as you would see it in. Uh, the JavaScript world. And this is in some way a consequence of living in this JavaScript world where everything can have a side effect, everything has a side effect, and you have, even when you read values, you must be aware that uh, this value can be changed somewhere else, even if there are no threads currently, they, they're probably just lurking around the corner. Um, and um, um, so you need to write everything in I.O. So it becomes less pleasant to read. This is one of the nasty things I would say. And of course you can build abstractions around this, but this is basically the bottom line uh, of what you need to write down. Um, some of these functions are already available. Um, there is a library available. Uh, there are some reference to places on the net where you can find this on the last slide. Uh, so there are some, already some built-in routines for converting back between stream representations um, and for accessing the DOM, generating HTML, uh, some bit of AJAX codes, wrapping around jQuery. So there's already a little bit of functionality available. Okay, so in the end you will end up with, with HTML where this, uh, this code is used. Uh, does not differ very much, and the only thing you have to do is now incorporate the generated code. So that's basically the only difference. The rest remains the same. So, um, one of the problems you encounter is that you have to live with uh, JavaScript world, uh, JavaScript objects inside uh, Haskell. So, the idea is that you can still manipulate values from this JavaScript world, um, but in some way you have a problem with Type, typing. Um, uh, the whole JavaScript world is untyped and it is kind of difficult to circumvent this typelessness in the JavaScript world. So what has been done in the library is to represent objects just by phantom types, um, in this case the JS pointer. Um, and um, the idea is that uh, you only use uh, this JS pointer um, 
in such a way that these values only can be generated from the runtime, from JavaScript runtime and library functions. So this provides you with access to these values and well, in the end you will have a little bit of uh, functional flavor added to uh, the actual use of these objects. So what you require, uh, what actually is available in the library, is a function uh, primitive which takes the name of a prototype and then gives you back an empty object. Or you can just create an empty anonymous object. What you then can do is just use getters and setters, modifications, and in the end you can package this of course in lenses to make it a bit more palatable. Um, but still you are kind of hung to this, this restricted world. So, uh, low level types are polymorphic. You would hope that these phantom types are really only phantom types, but actually you as a programmer are forced to guarantee type safety by uh, knowing magically or, or any other way that the type you choose in the Haskell world makes sense in relation to a value or a type in the JavaScript world. So you lose type safety and in order to get it back you have to program it yourself. So there's a little bit more functionality available um, because it's after in the end it's quite handy to do this all in the JavaScript world. So uh, there's also functionality available to uh, to clone values so you can have a bit more uh, pure way that is uh, you don't have to live in the side effect world. And what you also want to avoid in the end is too much of this code where you manually take, create an empty object and then incrementally add fields to it. Uh, because for the major part you will probably have an equivalent Haskell type available. So what you also might want is exploit the fact that constructor variants are very similar to actual corresponding data types in the JavaScript world, prototypes there. So you want to convert automatically from the from a Haskell type, from a Haskell value to uh, an actual uh, value living in the JavaScript world. So there is a special import, a special foreign import notation with a runtime um, counterpart which inspects and thus knows the Haskell constructor structure, uh, picks this apart and constructs a new one in the JavaScript world on the fly evaluating all fields. So there is knowledge uh, introduced by the compiler exploited by this interface function. And then you can more easily take an arbitrary uh, Haskell object and convert it to a corresponding JavaScript one. Okay, so there is also application built around it, um, which I will just mention. Um, I have a, uh, a compiled version is up and running somewhere on the net. Uh, Chris Dunn put it there. Uh, there's a web page describing it, what's in there. But the basic idea is there that it's uh, product machinery running in a browser interfacing with, uh, with a database, uh, database backend. I will not immediately show it, but there is a lot of, uh, it's, it's a relatively heavy. JavaScript application, so there's a lot of functionality buried inside this, this inside this whole application, and as a side effect, there is this library factored out, which is used and exploited by this uh, this application. There are some catches here and there. Um, sometimes things lock because there is no real way of, uh, of of dealing with threats currently. Uh, it's also a bit ingenious how you have to deal with the state and state changes globally inside a browser. You do this by building applications which are done rebound to entries uh, activated from the JavaScript. So there's some, 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 some ingenuity, so to say, implemented there. Okay, so finally, um, well, some lessons to be learned, or at least observations to be made, or you might call them hurdles, hurdles or you might call them challenges, depending on your negative or positive view on life. Um, so, we are confronted, and we, we do have a different execution platform. 
So that basically has some consequences. And um, so let's just have a precise look, a bit more precise look, um, what some of the consequences are. Um, UHC allows multiple backends. That means that UHC on its own puts files in different places depending on the name of the backend. Ideally, they should be done by a build system. Ideally, they should be done, in this case, by Cabal. But regretfully, uh, there's no way of communicating variation of backend currently between Cabal and the compiler. So, uh, the, I think the, the wider lesson to be learned is if you allow different backends, uh, and that's slightly different than just different platforms, because DHC, I saw there are 11 platforms, but these are all Unix platforms. And the consequence of this is that you suddenly end up with a situation where artifacts cannot be shared anymore uh, because you generate JavaScript and not .o files. So you cannot merge. Um, so that's one observation, and uh, I expect that at some point, some point in the future, people will also ask for Android, for iPhone, and whatever, and these are all limited environments, so you will end up with the notion of having uh, also different backends available. Um, a similar observation lies in the environment of the, yeah, different libraries, and uh, it just simply turns out that there is no uh, there's no environment for um, for using I/O. You don't open files in JavaScript, but you can access a browser. So there's something lost, something gained. How do you distinguish libraries? How do you tag them? So UAC currently is very brute in this and just says this this library module must be excluded for a particular backend. Not a very nice solution, but for the time it just runs. And if guess that when the community has to deal with multiple backends, that is also is coming to, into play, to, into, into sight, this problem. Another one is uh, also probably a bit more particular to UAC. Uh, uh, GAC is quite big and large, lots of features, and UAC is a lot smaller, less maintenance possible, uh, less advanced features available and the consequence of it is that if you want to use it, you have to limit yourself. Um, and the other way around um, is that uh, on occasions, there are, on multiple occasions, there are libraries available in Hackage which would be very handy to use. For example, people want to <coughs> use functional reactive programming libraries, but they make use of uh, functional dependencies which are not available in UHC. So, you end up uh, in a situation where not all libraries can be readily exploited. So, in this case, it's a bit paradox paradoxically that the success of all these features uh, works against a compiler which is more limited. I don't see a solution, actually, and it also depends a little bit on... Um, well, I think it's a good thing to have multiple compilers, but uh, just for experimentation, but it is difficult for a small compiler to do it all. So, a workaround would be that it would be more clear what kind of a set of functionality is offered by or what is required by libraries. And this holds even for base library where there is something like extensible exceptions which use existentials, which is also a non-standard feature. So, um, of course, these are a bit more general observations, and there are, of course, the small stuff. Uh, UHC needs a lot of work. Um, JavaScript specific stuff, linking, loading, minimizing code, maybe obfuscation, etc. And there is also the, the problem of user interfaces. What kind of user interface do you choose? On the, in, the, in the GHC world, has to play, has the world with the WH widgets, for example. But that did, this simply does not exist, the counterpart of it. So it would be very convenient if there would be a portable viewing library. And there is lots of other stuff uh, to be looked at. So, in conclusion, good news, it works. Bad news, it needs a lot of work to make it really usable. And if you want to know more, a couple of websites where you can find more information. Okay, that's, that's it on my part. Ready to go.
so Chris, so Chris, which you mentioned before, I think he has written also JavaScript backend for GHC, or a subset of Haskell called Fay. Have you yeah. looked at what he did, and how does your work compare it to his? No, actually, I've only looked a little bit longer at GHCJS, which was um, left alone already for, for some time when I looked at it, and quite recently at Haste. Um, so no, I did not look at Faye. When you do it's backwards. Oh. When you do the foreign expression language, is that what you call it? Um, are those things? Textual templates that are then evaled in JavaScript, or they follow a certain set of forms and are literally compiled to JavaScript? Um, there's an intermediate language for representing this, oh. so there's an abstract syntax for it. Right. Uh, and then this is interpreted, evaluated with an environment of arguments, which then generates an abstract representation of JavaScript, and this is then mapped to actual text. Ah, okay, good. So this so is the end is an eval in the JavaScript world. Uh, no, it's not an eval in JavaScript, it's done statically uh, compile time. Yeah. Um, one main use of uh, Haskell to say that JavaScript compiler that I would want as a programmer, just practically speaking, is for validation. If I write a web service, I have to validate the input of some form on the server side for security. So I want to use the same code on the browser to, to give um, the user a warning that something's wrong. Um, which leads to the question, which of the, or are there any of the current major Haskell frameworks um, compatible with the U compiler? So can you run either of ESOT or SNAP or Hashtag, or is it just user beyond U compiler at the moment? Beyond. OK, that's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> So you said that you don't have type safety, right? Because JavaScript might do uh, give you peculiar data. Are there any circumstances in which you, you can guarantee type safety? Maybe if you're doing a combination of JavaScript isn't working in combination or something? Um, a, a student ex one of the students experimented with it, and we or we did play with think with the thought of writing additional functionality in the JavaScript world, like indeed checking that this is a particular type, particular instance of type, and then returning uh, the corresponding uh, constructor for it in the Haskell world. <coughs> that would guarantee some form of type safety, um, but we didn't go much forth, much further than that. Basically, it's up to the programmer to, choose to make it type safe. And that's something, yeah, which is arguably not what you want. Thank you. Yeah, very different. Yeah, just to kind of follow up. So, but that form of the type unsafety is a JavaScript kind of unsafety, right? Yeah. I mean, so if I suck something as an integer out in the Haskell world and it's not in JavaScript, which is unfortunately very common, you're doing the standard JavaScript conversion to integer, presumably, before you pull it into the Haskell world. Um, no, actually not. Uh, the, the, the numerical value as it is, uh -huh. is taken, uh, and you only do special stuff uh, when it concerns word 8 and word 16 and stuff like that by, by, by limiting the Right, word. so you're going to let JavaScript deal with the problem, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Delete 